Okay, back to everything going on. And there we go. Okay. Uh, back to chapter six. And so, when this is pushed on D2L, there will be, I guess, right now, two parts. Because in just what happened, those fun little technical things of working distance learning. All right. So, when companies have this cycle, they have a second cycle that's going on. Again, they have one that they want to do cash. Yeah, you're still working widely. That's where all the homework and everything is. And uh, make sure you're on Remind, because I will be sending reminders at the beginning of the week of what's going on. But everything is opened on Wiley. All right. So, with our inventory cycle, yay, we will always have beginning inventory to start off. Then we're going to add cost of goods sold. But um, we'll, we'll figure out something. Then you can log into the mine. Um, but, but, so we're going to add our cost of goods sold, or our first goods purchase, sorry, and together those make our available for sale. Again, yeah, that's the whole inventory that we had during this cycle. During this cycle, some of the inventory will be sold. Thus, this is what creates cost of goods sold. Right down here in this bottom corner. Other one will be ending inventory. This again is inventory that is not sold. All three of these though will fall into a count called merchandise inventory. In fact, merchandise inventory is used basically mostly for anything inventory for this course. It's a nice Count. From there, we actually have two different inventory systems. One is known as perpetual, which basically means it stays in motion. So we're constantly checking inventory levels and updating our accounting system. And the other one is known as periodic. And this is, again, we update it at the end of the accounting period to reflect the purchases and sales of inventory. So one usually done at the end of the period, the other one stays updated. So this is basically the difference between the one the top four that can only afford the periodic inventory to probably Walmart or Amazon, you can always update your system. Okay. Now, when we record inventory, so under the perpetual system, we do a purchase of the mer uh, merchandise inventory. And again, this can be done in either two ways. Because we have two methods. Again, they can buy inventory on cash, or they can buy it on account. This will always increase inventory accounts if we're purchasing. Okay? Or basically the buyer. And then it will either increase depending on how we pay for it. We buy it on credit. Accounts payable. If it's cash, it will actually decrease cash. Again, asset to asset, and another one's asset to liability. 
And honestly, if we ever go and purchase anything, we better have some documentation to it. Here, you're pretty much going to just have, that's what we did. But in the real, real world, uh, make sure that you have a purchase invoice. And this is going to provide all the information we need plus whatever discount period we have. So, with that, we would also have in your discount period, we're not going to go too heavily depth into discounts in this course. In your 2301, if you go on say 2301, you do go in depth to discount period. So you'll learn a little bit here, but overall, it's mostly going to be in 2301. Now, with the purchases, you also have a return. Because again, not all merchandise is perfect. And when you receive it, it may not be up to your satisfaction, so you will return it. So remember when a return happens, the biggest thing is that inventory has to be created. We don't have it anymore. We gave it back. And we're going to probably decrease if it was on account. And again, that's a liability. We no longer owe it. Or we're going to increase our cash because we it's got cash in return. Depends on how we get it. So, here's how it works on a tablet. We have salt stereo. And then we receive an invoice for TW, auto supply for goods. Uh, basically, with a purchase price of 3800 on account. So we already know on account, we're dealing with accounts payable. And receiving goods for salt stereo. So, uh, Happen to return some goods to PW with a cost of 300. Okay. So, what's this? First off, cash flows when it's still on account, there is none. What I have blank here. Okay. So there's no effect on our cash flows. But, since we bought inventory, since this is a purchase one anyway, inventory does have to increase. Okay. On the other hand, since this is on account, on account will also have to increase. It shows that we still owe this amount to PW. Again, there will be no effect on the income statement due to nothing happening to revenue or expense. Next, they decide to return goods. So when they return goods, that is an effect of 3,300 losing on inventory. So how much inventory does salt have right now? What's the cost of their inventory? So, what's 3,800 minus 300? Yeah. 
Good. Make sure you type it in the chat, okay? That kind of scares me a little bit. <laughs> okay? Uh, again, my PC is it's loud so that it can record properly. So, make sure. Chat room. Alright, so I appreciate it. That was a enthusiastic answer. So, yay! Alright. So, that's the purchase side. That's all I really want you to know on purchases is how to basically put in the inventory for a buyer and then how to handle a return right now. So, depending on the method that they buy the inventory is how we're going to affect. Most of the time it's going to be on account. Again, I have the homework videos to help you through the homework. Next, what happens with a sale? Okay. So we're going to look at PW on this side. So we're going to look on the other half of this. So when we sell merchandise, there's always two transactions that have to happen. One is the sale. Okay. Now, that sale, again, can be cash, which we can increase since we got money in, or it can increase accounts receivable. Again, this is if it's on account. Remember this, when we're the seller, we do expect to get money for the products we sell. So, if we don't get the money right away, well, we expect to receive it in the future. This is why we're using accounts receivable. The other transaction that we have is known as the cost of goods sold transaction. And this transaction is to basically show the how much it costs us to get the inventory for us. So, the basically the original buying price. So, still with that count for increased cost of goods sold and decreased inventory. Okay, then we sold our inventory. Next, if we have a return, okay, a return, again, sometimes goods are coming back to us, we would actually dealt with, so, like up here, where the returns affected inventory and accounts payable, notice that ours we'll still have two accounts, or two transactions. One is again done with the sale, but we cannot affect sales. So we have a special account called sales returns and allowances. Okay? Sales returns and allowances takes in all the returns or what we call an allowance. And allowance, I mean the difference between the two it says this, if it's a return, that means goods came back to us, and okay? we accepted the goods back or the inventory back. This gives us a second journal entry in where we have to show that we received the inventory, okay? So, that one, we have to deal with that. But if it's an allowance, this is the key difference. And an allowance is where we allow the buyer to keep the goods, but we refund them a portion of their money. Or basically, uh, they don't owe us if it was on credit. So, we do have those. 
and you have to keep uh, an eye on how did the return happen, okay? We receive goods, we have another account. If we don't, then it's just the basic sales and returns. And then the last special account that you may have is, of course, sales discounts. And this, again, when we basically offer, if you pay within a certain time period, you get a certain amount of money off. Are in inventory. Okay, again, not too much discounts in this course. We just want you to know the basics of what's going on. All right, so let's go through the same example as above. Okay. Starting off first, bulk cereal. Again, receives the invoice. So PW, we'll look at PW. And they sold this 3800 on account. Okay. Again, no effect on cash flows. Don't have to worry about that. We do know this, since this is a sale, we're going to the sale first. This is going to be an increase to our revenue. Yeah. Okay. That's basically sales. Next, since it was on account, and we expect to receive this money, we're going to deal with the accounts receivable. Out of this sale, we assume that it basically cost EW originally to get the product 2400 So, we have to show the effect of that one in our tablet. It does mean that inventory will decrease and our expense will also show a negative. This is our cost of goods sold. Okay? So this is the first transaction to basically record the sale or two accounts that we have going on. Next, going to this, since we're using the previous, SOAP did return $300 of product. Okay? So they return goods. We didn't tell them to keep it, we told them to return it. So with that, we're dealing with, again, returns. So we need to record, again, two transactions. So, first one is the receipt of the goods back. Which will lower their account receivable because we expect no more money back from us. And for your tower, it's going to show a decrease in revenue. But it's going to be to account sales, returns, and allowances. Okay. Next, since this is good coming back, and it associates with 140 of the original purchase price for PW, originally given, again, no effect on cash. You didn't deal with cash at all in this transaction. We know inventory will have to increase. We accepted goods back. So again, my warehouse has now inventory. Well, this would also mean I cannot recognize the expense of purchasing some originally because some of it came back. So this is going to affect expense in a positive way that is going to reduce cost of goods sold. Because I didn't really sell those goods. They came back. Okay. All right. Any questions over buying and selling? Okay. 
Again, if you have no questions, please type in no so I know you can still hear me. Alright, well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Again, if you do have questions later on, you can always send uh, emails or anything else to get with me. If you need to do a private Zoom or Zoom uh, little tutoring session, sorry, we'll have to. Alright. Next, and again, time crunch, we're going ahead and head to inventory. And how do we calculate ending inventory and cost of sold based on this course? So the whole account is called sales returns and allowances. So when we receive inventory on return, this just basically triggers this second journal entry. Okay? Because so inventory actually came back to us. Now, if it does end up coming to allowance, if this was a he told Saul to keep the inventory or basically keep the goods and we're going to reduce the cost, you don't do this entry. You don't record a cost of goods entry because you still didn't get the product. Okay? But the whole account is called returns and allowances. Good question. Uh, okay. So, how do we Figure out ending inventory and cost of goods sold, a little bit more in depth. Again, this whole chapter deals with many concepts that you get to dive in depth into 2301. So there's four common methods to the madness. One is, of course, FIFO, which is first in, first out, which again, we want to basically take the older cost and expense them out first. Then we take the newer cost. Well, on the reverse, we have LIFO, which is last in, first out, which wants to take the newest cost and expense them before the oldest. And they do have their advantages, as this one basically this inventory approximately on its current cost, while this one gets cost of its sold probably to its current cost. Either way, they're just estimates. Okay? We just assume a product, the oldest product sold, when in actually probably not true. The other two, of course, is weight and average and specific identification. Weighted average is as simple as all we do is take how many inventory we have, divide by their to divide it into the total cost, and we find basically on average how much does each inventory item cost us. On the other side, specific ID is what it is, all inventory has an identification number that we can trace exactly to. So we know the exact cost of every item that we sold. And going a little bit faster here, because again, got to get through most of this chapter today. So, here's Pictogram form of them. Again, using example of shirts, we only bought three shirts. 
one on May 1st for $45, one on May 3rd for $65, and one on May 6th for $70. After this time frame, we end up selling one shirt for 100 bucks. So again, my sales is the same across the board. They're all $100. Okay? Doesn't change. What changes is confidence sold in inventory. So, on your first and first out, again, the expense to hold this first. So that one shirt, for us, we said it cost us $45, giving us a gross profit of $55. All the remaining stays in inventory. LIFO says, no, no, no. We sold this for seven. We still sold it for a hundred, but it actually cost us seventy dollars to sell that shirt. Okay? So our gross profit is only thirty, with our inventory being a hundred and ten. Weighted average just says, let's see it neutral. Let's just smooth it over, and we're going to say that each of these shirts cost us sixty bucks because we have three. Total cost is 180, so they basically cost us $60 each. So we actually made gross profit of 40, and inventory ends up being 120. On the fun side, specific ID just goes, hey, I know exactly what we sold it for, and we usually use this non-closing, but probably on more higher end electronics. And that's why they're showing TVs. Hey, if I think those are TVs, they look like TVs, but those are sure small TVs. But that's basically how it will go. So, we're going, again, I know this one tripped you up. So, again, I'm trying to go through this as easy as possible. So, we're going to take this company called Houston Electronics. And of course, the book loves to have puns, and they sell what they call Astro Condensers. And I like how they line it up too. But, that's just how the book is. I just do puns when they can. So we know January 1st, we have beginning inventory. April 15th, we made some purchases. August 24th, some more purchases. So forth and so on. Again, your book is doing the inventory a little bit different than what you're going to learn in 2301. Uh, in 2301, or more on the perpetual side, while your book is more on periodic. Okay. So you can learn both methods if you take both courses. All right. So from here, we're only looking at our purchases and beginning inventory. We want to add all those up. This is known as, again, our units of variable for sale. Then we're going to add all their costs. That was $10, 11 12 13 multiplied by how many units. So this gives us our total cost. Right now, it also tells us how many in inventory, in inventory, how much is still left. So basically, how much is still in our warehouse? About 450 So that means we sold... 550 of these products. Okay. So, we want to know what is the value of inventory that basically we sold and how much is still in the warehouse. So, FIFO. First thing we're going to do is figure in the inventory. So, basically, we're going to find the value of the 450 in this example.
So we have our date, units, unit cost, and total cost. Okay. These little charts can help you out, and you can probably take them when you do the exam to help you out. Now remember, FIFO is usually their definition is first in, first out. But when we're looking at any inventory, we always look at last because that is what's currently in our warehouse is the last inventory that we purchased. Okay? And again, we've already sold the first product. That's the definition of first in, first out. So basically, when you see these, and you remember how the acronym goes, just remember it's the opposite of either first out or last out. Okay? So, going through here, he has 450. The last purchase is 400. Well, again, I know that does not make 450. So I'm going to come up by calculator. Okay. So again, I know I started with 450. I minus the last purchase 400 so this shows me I still have a positive number of items in the warehouse I have to account for but this also tells me that my warehouse has all 400 of the units so we know that that helps us out because one, the chart already gives us the numbers, less things that we have to calculate. So now we have to figure out the 50. Okay, when we do this, we look at the next purchase up, and basically from the last one, that was 300. Now, look, even though it's obvious that if I minus 300, it's going to go negative. The only reason why I'm doing this is if you're trying to think of where the stopping point is, wait till your inventory number goes negative. Once it goes negative, then we know we don't go further on valuation. So we're not going to look at $11 or $10. Here, since it went negative, my stopping point is 12. Okay? So that means all remaining units that's in the warehouse comes from the $12 price point. So $450, and $12. Then all you have to do is add them together. This verifies that I've accounted for the 450 in the inventory, and the total cost is five thousand eight hundred. Okay. From here, we're going to figure out cost is sold because we already know one big number: total cost. So, cost of goods available for sale: twelve thousand. We want to subtract out from step one our total cost that we know of in the inventory. And that gives us cost of goods sold, 6200 Okay? Any questions over FIFO? Alright, so LIFO, again, come back over LIFO, do the opposite of its out, or it's beginning, less in, that's messed up. So, opposite of these, 
from being ego, but first we look at envy. Okay. So, again, same thing, just the opposite. Here, the dollar calculator. We start at 450. At this time, we go from the beginning inventory. This is still in our warehouse, according to FIFO, because we sell from uh, basically the last product that came in. So that means the older we sell there. So take my first unit, and we still have a positive number. So again, this tells me that we still have all 100 units in inventory. Okay. Next, we go to the next price point. So, I take now the 350 that we still need to account for in the warehouse. And the next units going down is 200. Gee, I'm still in positive land. But again, that tells me all 200 were still accounted for in the warehouse. Lastly, we go to 300. Let's see if it finally goes negative. Up, oh, and it does. So now that it went negative, I know this is my stopping point is $12. That means the remaining amount has to be twelve dollars in multiplication. So I don't touch the thirteen. So the remaining amount was one hundred and fifty times twelve. Again, after we figure out how many units, well, basically accounts for our units in the warehouse, we just total everything up, making sure we double check that we have the ending inventory that we didn't accidentally do too much and the cost associated to it. Again, just the adding of these. Then we do exactly the same steps we did up here for cost of goods sold. We take our available for sale and we subtract our first step, which is again the cost of any inventory. From there, there's our cost of goods sold. Okay. Again, just want you to understand the basics of how we account for inventory on a periodic scale. Again, in 2301, you will do perpetual. So you get to do it a little bit different, but concepts are going to grossly be about the same. All right. So, any questions on this, though? This is starting to get a little bit easier, right? After like, what is this, the third or fourth time that we went over? Your memory is refreshing. Again, I know it's been like over a month since we've done the inventory basis. So, all right, weighs average. How is it easiest out of the bunch? Again, I have total cost, total units, and unit cost. All we're going to do is take total cost, again, which we know of, and divide it by total units. So basically we're finding the cost per unit. Once we do this, you want to find any inventory on the uh, periodic. We just take however many units we have in the warehouse and times it by the cost we figured out. That's basically it. 
weighted average, I think, is probably the easiest of the bunch because you don't really have to go back and look at what's sold. All you have to do is figure out the total cost per unit. Okay. And then if you follow the same steps, top goods available for sale, 12000 minus our in inventory. We'll have a cost of goods of sold of six thousand six hundred. And basically, if you want only you know, really under this method, you can very verify this amount very easily. So again, that would just be the five hundred and fifty that we sold times twelve dollars, or times the cost, and that would should equal out to that. But either way. Those are basic, the basic steps. Okay. Now, you may end up facing a multiple choice question asking you what are the effects? Well, the main effects that end up happening between the two or between the three is one again in the inventory. Ending inventory will be different depending on how costs are moving. Again, the unit cost. These guys are basically increasing. So prices are rising. This is usually what's going to happen between FIFO and LIFO. LIFO's inventory will be less while the net income should also be less on your LIFO, which we can see here. Because of prices to get the products are increasing, both of these two numbers are showing as less. So FIFO is a little bit greater. Wage average will always fall in between. But if somehow, you have it going where it's falling. So every time we purchase new products, we get it cheaper and cheaper. That would mean FIFO is should be the less amount. While LIFO is greater than. Okay. It's really the only thing in odds on that's gonna be a multiple choice question on the exam. So, remember this also, if somehow uh, you get a true or false statement on this, usually is this. Inventory, when we value them, is not an actual match to the actual physical flow of inventory yet. These are just assuming the cost. They're estimating. The only inventory method that can do it is specific identification, which we're not even really going over. So, specific ID again will tell you exactly what inventory sold. So we know our cost. But the other three are not a physical match. Okay? Now, when it comes to corporations, again, Most of the time, LIFO is going to be the best. It's going to be the best item for us not paying as much taxes. Okay? This is why LIFO is starting to become more popular. But right now, with the price is going down, people may end up switching to FIFO. We'll see. But if you do choose LIFO as your inventory method, you will have what is known as a LIFO conformity rule, which is by the IRS stating that both your financial statements and your tax have to follow LIFO, have to be both methods. And if you're going to change, it's going to take some paperwork to change it. Right now, again, 
most companies are going to do a basic FIFO. It's just really up to the company itself. So, but you, it's starting to become more favorable. More corporations are doing FIFO. All small businesses are still under FIFO. And some are actually doing weighted average because they just don't care. Again, we'll get back to the concept checks later on. I got a lot of stuff to go through. So, again, we've mentioned receivables. So, receivables in themselves. Mostly it's going to deal, again, with the seller, and we're expected to receive a certain amount of money. And this is, again, when we're dealing with two types of parties. One is known as the creditor, and one is known as the debitor. And basically, the creditor is the one that extends the credit and expects to receive cash, while the debitor has to owe money. So we're going to deal with two main types. Usually that's what they always do in these intro courses, and that's of course the common one, accounts receivable. And this is the amount owed from customers for credit sales. At the same time, we have note receivables. These are also amounts owed by customers or other parties, but they have one of the things tacked on in interest. Yeah, interest. Both of these simply deal with customers or can result from sales transactions are known as trade receivables. So anytime we deal with the receivable from a sales, that is known as a trade. So all it is, that's just another term that we use. So of course, if you're looking at receivables again, Amount coming in from someone, someone we expect. You have other kinds. We're going to focus on these three, but you could also have rent, something coming from employees, tax refund, stimulus receivable. You have that one. Whatever. Again, expecting money coming to us. So, Again, when we look at these, we do expect the money to come to us. But, unfortunately, not everybody likes to pay. And when they don't pay, this brings us a brand new account called bad debt expense. Basically, it's like when food goes bad and we have to trash it, well, we're going to trash these accounts. If you get rid of them. And most of the time, again, this is going with the matching principle, or we have to, for corporations, again, match our expense due to the income that is being generated. Now, there is two methods to the madness to determine uncollectible bad debt. First one we're going to look at is the direct write-off method. And it's the most simple and logical to apply as it goes directly to bad debt expense and it's only removed when we know that client will not pay us. And the problem is it does not attempt to estimate bad debts. And does not follow our matching principle. Okay. So, for corporations, this is a no-go. But for small businesses, we can do this. And we're not really under the big bad boy of the SEC. So, when the company writes off, like here, assume that Warden Co. Writes off M E grand two 
200 ballots as uncollectible on December 12th. So their balance is basically being thrown away. We're saying you no longer owe us because you're never going to pay us. So we're going to write you off. This will mean this. Since their account is going away. Oh, yeah, let's do a blink. Account receivable is going down, it is being negatively affected. Because again, we're removing that account receivable. Next, since this is direct, it will immediately affect expense. Okay, remember we want to keep it the same. This has no effect on cash flows. Again, there is no cash moving. But it does affect income statement as bad debt spins. Okay. So, any questions regarding the direct method? Next, probably a little bit more difficult one to deal with because, again, this is done with estimating. So, this allowance method in itself is going to estimate that debt expense in the period that we usually have ourselves. And it will always estimate at the end of the period and it's going to bring a brand new account called allowance for doubtful accounts. Now, it can go by different names like allowance for bad debts or allowance for uncollectible amounts account, but we're going to keep it as allowance for doubtful accounts. This bad boy is a contra asset. So again, it falls under asset category, but it will be negative in its natural course of operations. So to increase it will be a negative. So that's what we're going to show. But we'll go through with the examples. So Hampton Furniture has credit sales of 1,200,000 in 2017, of which 200,000 remains uncollectible at December 31st. The credit manager that estimates that 12,000 of these receivables will prove uncollectible. So when you look at these work problems, again, to define which method, watch out for the key of estimating. Okay. So again, we're going to write this up. Now, Please see actually show a beginning balance. Okay. So again, they're just showing what's going on. So the transaction again is not going to have an effect on cash. Not messing with cash when we write off the account. Here, since we're estimating the twelve thousand. This is going to start off at showing allowance for doubtful account as negative 12,000. Okay? So, we have a negative. Then we record the expense. Bad debt expense are also negative. When we do the initial estimate, all this is 
and thus recognizing a bad debt at the end of the period. Doesn't mean that all this is going to be uncollectible. But we're making a reasonable adjustment based on historical facts or other items as we're going to get through in a little bit. Okay? But all that happens when you do the initial estimate is this tabular entry. We'll get into how we write it off in just a sec. So, when this happens, this is known as net reliable value. Basically, the difference of house receivable and allowance for doubtful accounts. 200,000 minus our ADA count. So, this is when the multiple choice question that may have a little bit of a workout tells you find net reliable value. Again, all you do is take a house receivable and subtract allowance for doubtful count. All right, from there, we can now do a write-off. Okay. So, I want to again show you what's been going on. Okay, so this is what we've done previously. So you can see how the process is running. Okay, assume that the vice president of the company we're working on is this. Finds out on March 1st, 2018, that RA Rare basically is going to be written off. We're going to remove his account. Okay. So again, his account being removed, we know specifically it's going to be him. So again, just like the direct write off method. We're going to lower accounts receivable by negative 500. This will also mean that allowance for doubtful accounts will increase, or not increase, but have a positive number because it is also decreasing. But basically it shows the offset effect because all we're doing is changing two assets here. Because now this is our catch. After we've established at the end of the year that the expense, we've already recognized the expense. It's been done. We're not double dipping. Here, allowance for doubtful accounts now basically owns any time a write-off happens. This only happens under the allowance method. Again, giving us no effect on either end. So, this would mean that my total balance right now in accounts receivable would be 199,500. And then amounts for accounts is 11,500 in itself. Which Oddly enough, this net reliable value will not change. So before the write-off was 188,000, difference of those two. But notice, since we both decrease both accounts, it will remain the same. So in the world, it's no change. Investor will still see 188,000. Full part. All right. Any questions over writing off allowance for doubtful, or writing off under the allowance for method? So. All right. So 
now comes the tricky part. Okay? This chapter throws a lot of tricky parts to you. One is namely inventory. I always think inventory is always tricky. The next is actually how do we estimate allowance for doubtful accounts. Okay, let's have some fun. Your book is only going to give you basically two methods. Uh, in 2301, you get three, but one is basically combined, so whatever. So, under our estimate, we have actually, I don't even do percentage of sales. I'm thinking doing percentage of sales. So, all right. So, it really just gives you one tested testing, but we're going to look at both receivable methods. One is percentage of receivables, and this basically will just take the percentage that we assume our receivables is going to be uncollectible. So, if I have 20,000 and it's tax receivable, and I multiply it by thinking that, oh yeah, about 5% will be uncollectible. So, at 0 0.05, this is the amount that we are deeming to be uncollectible, or basically the ending balance of allowance or doubtful account. So, since this is an ending balance of uh, allowance for doubtful accounts, you have to be aware of what's currently involved. And we're going to get into this with the other report. So, basically, that was just that method multiplying. But this age of receivables, the next one, basically takes this method. And sends it into overdrive. Yes, the most amazing part of ever. We're going to literacy. Ah. So the main method that your book really likes is what is known as aging of receivables. And basically, it's going to look like this. Nice little chart. And this chart right here will always list your company or uh, customers. So, so it's going to list all your customers. And this example basically lists a few, and then group the rest under others. That's fine. Again, it's probably too many customers for them to list, so we have to keep it this way. From here, it's going to give you your totals. So this is how much. Each customer owes us basically money or how much we expect to receive. They'll also give us a time frame. If it has not yet due, these are current amounts. Now, once it hits the actual date, this means they passed their due date. So, you have some that are at 0 through 30. 31 through 60, 61 through 90, and then some that are over 90 days old are basically past due. Whoa. Right now, we have to assume these amounts, uh, percentages. Basically, these are the uncollectible percentages that we deem that we're not going to get paid back or these Take it on me back debt. So, as you can see, with an aging report, we kind of figure the higher, I mean, the longer that they go past due, the less likely we're going to get money back. So, when we look at one of these tables, first thing we have to do is total up each column. Okay. So that's what we've done. 
So not yet due. That's a total of 27,000. 0 to 30, 5,700. 31 to 63 grand, so forth and so on. From here, we take the percentages that we know. Again, match them to the column. We're going to multiply each percentage. Okay. So, we multiply each percentage, and these will be the numbers that you get. Okay. We still need no total uncollectible. Okay. So, in order to figure out total uncollectible, under this method, we'll take all of these and basically add them together. If we add up all the columns, you come out to 2,228. This is the amount that is deemed as total uncollectible or your ending balance in allowance for doubtful accounts. Now, under your tabler, I have nothing there. First thing you have to do is bring in whatever balance we have. We have $528 in our balance. But, remember this, the allowance for doubtful accounts, even though we see positive numbers, remember, under the tabler, it's going to act a little bit different. It's going to be a negative. And even though it's showing positive up here, remember, this is a natural credit balance, or basically natural doing the opposite, the contra asset. So, when it's positive, it's actually affecting the books negatively. Because it likes to do opposites, the contra. So, beginning balance in accounts receivable, we can figure this out. From the chart, 39,600. Counts for doubtful accounts that was given to us. Next is doing, is figuring out the amount of allowance for doubtful accounts. So again, I know the total. Total is negative 2,228. Okay. Right there. What I have to figure out is what gets me to a negative 2,228. Okay. Again, the easiest thing is they show as the same sign. Okay. They're both basically the same. You can just easily subtract out the two numbers. So, 228 minus 128 will mean I have a 1700 difference to get me to that amount. So, if I take a negative 528, a negative 1,700, that would be get me to a negative 2,228. Again, that is not fair, and since this was an estimate, this is basically showing our bad debt expense. Okay, this is why we do the general entry again. For an estimate, not writing off anybody, not doing anything else. We're just trying to figure out how much more do we need to increase 
allows for bad debt, or allows for doubtful accounts to get to the ending estimated balance. Woo! So again, have to do the journal entry. Thank you for what it is, tablet entry. So we decrease expense for bad debt. All right. Any questions over this one? This is probably one of the hardest parts of this chapter. All right. All right. So yes, this is the only method leave your book will throw at you as it's all what I saw. But again, it's just a step by step process. All right. Again, I'll go back through pretty much the concept checks uh, next time so that we kind of get like a refresher of last chapter before we hit into chapter 7. So, another concept that's thrown at y'all. A concept. I guess we didn't. Hello. Anyway, uh, multiple income, <laughs> what is a multiple step income statement and how is it prepared? With these, it's basically knowing formulas. And first off is what makes gross profit? Well, again, gross profit is your net sales minus cost of goods sold. That is gross profit. Income from operations. We'll take that gross profit and minus operating expenses. Now, for a net income, this could be also the stopping point for a net income, but there may be some other items. These other items are known as other revenues and gains, or other expenses and losses. So the formula is basically going to be income from operations plus revenue and gains that are other minus other expenses and losses. Now, the breakdown of these, first off with operating expenses, we could divide these into two groups. Be the problem that you're dealing with, because sometimes we don't want you to do this, but I'm showing you how it goes with most multiple income statements. It can be separated basically into selling expense, which is basically your selling department. So any expenses incurred, like advertising, how they make sales, so basically salaries of the workers, uh, office equipment for just the selling department, stuff like that. Uh, and also, how do we deliver goods to our customers? I mean, part of selling expense. The remaining will be known as G&A, or General Administrative. Again, these support all other aspects of the company. This is the accounting department, human resource, finance, and again, things that basically would be not selling. When we look at this part, uh, net income formula, where you saw other revenues and gains and other expenses, Normally, those are from activities that are not in the natural course of business. So, other revenues, of course, are income basically generated from these 
events. Most of the time, it could be interest revenue, dividends. As for a retailer, we're talking about we're receiving rent revenue. That's not a normal course for a retailer. Um, and probably any games, I mean, basically sell off the assets, which we get into Chapter 7 with. Other expenses, again, any expense in generating these items, they're not in the natural course. So interest expense, losses from selling an item, maybe even casualty losses. And casualty losses, again, could come from theft to um, hurricanes. Right now, the pandemic is kind of considered a casualty loss. So there's lots of ways that we can go. Again, not in the normal course of business. So they do give an example of PW audio supply. And right here, you can see the sales. So our gross profit going on. Here's our sales revenue minus their returns and allowances and discount to get net sales. Here comes the cost of goods sold, and there's our gross profit. Okay. Operating expenses, again, they kind of made it to where everything's the same, but that's fine. If they do it that way, it's okay. Again, we take out all the operating expenses, and this is known again as income from operations. And then lastly, we did have other revenue and other expense. Once again, interest, gain, part of that. We have expense, and it looks like some vandalism happened to them. So. That wasn't good, but either way. Then we have income before income taxes, and then of course income tax expense. Now occasionally, companies will estimate their tax. If they do, that's fine. It comes after everything that we know for income before taxes. We'll subtract out the tax expense and gives us the good old net income. All right. Does anybody have any questions over the multiple income statement, multiple step income statement? Okay. And then there's our concept check. So the last thing that we have again is ratios. And on these ratios, the two that we're going to check mostly is gross profit. Right? And again, these are always expressed in percentages. And really, they want to know how much profit do we earn after cost of goods sold. So basically, how much profit do we make based on our net sales? So here, the formula is gross profit divided by net sales. And they're looking at, for their example, REI. And they take their 2014. Again, this would have been their gross profit. This would have been the net sales. Once they divided, it comes out to 43.3%. Now, companies will compare to other companies and to the industry average to see where they stand. Again, these look great 
but there's a number of factors that can go into it that can essentially make it hard to get an exact, like, are you doing better or not? But it does help out to show that, hey, we are making money of our costs, but, and now it does look good for REI, how their sales, about, you know, almost like being 50 cents back from their sales after uh, cost of goods sold. So, again, cost of goods sold is probably making about 47% of uh, yeah, uh, their sales, 57, 57%. But they're doing better. Maybe by two tenths of a point, but they're doing better compared to 2013. They're having a better gross profit than big sporting goods, almost up 10%. Same thing with the industry average. Okay? Again, looks well. Next comes, though, the profit margin. Okay? And this one is really saying, hey, let's look at how well I'm selling compared to all my expenses. Using my sales, how much money am I making off my sales after all expenses are covered? As you can see, even though REI had a great uh, gross profit, here, for their example, they're showing that their net income was only 44118 Divided by their net sales means they only, in the end, make two cents off of every dollar that they sold. Yay, you were doing so well, and then all of a sudden, expenses, other expenses, operating expenses, ate us up. So we went from 43.3% to 2%. And if you compare year to year, 2013, they did a whole lot better. 2013 was 0.9%, so they basically raised a whole per point in percentage, which is hard to do. So they had to eliminate a lot of costs. Okay. But now compared to big sporting goods and the industry average, they are still have a way to go. Big sporting goods makes almost about 54 cents, no, no. Almost five cents per dollar. So, while well, the industry average, and they're still doing a lot better. They're three points out from REI. So, there's a way that we compare and contrast. Again, these ratios are going to show up again in chapter nine. In fact, I think every ratio we've gone over will show up in chapter nine. I think in nine, probably the one of the easiest chapters we have. Okay. But that is actually it for chapter seven. Oh, not chapter seven, chapter six. Oh, I'm already thinking chapter seven. So, any questions over chapter six at all? Okay. Uh, so, again, I would probably suggest to go ahead and knock out, if you haven't, the homework. Um, so that you can basically take care of those. If you want to, go ahead and try it. If you don't have the notes, again, 
Can I go ahead and go over the concept checks now in this notes and see if you understand them. Okay. I will go back over these uh, when we do chapter seven. And then we're going to basically knock out chapter seven. Next week, this is going to be the reminder again. And of course, I'll send out the information as we go forward. Next week, on Tuesday, we're going to go over Chapter 7 again. Okay? From Chapter 7, Thursday, we will open up the exam for 5, 6, and 7. Okay? From there, you have basically till Friday to complete the exam. The exam will be just like we're in class, so you only have one attempt at it. Okay? And it's going to be a mix of multiple choice and worked out problems. You will have the same amount of time that we would have in class, so I again would suggest to go ahead and make sure you have that time available to you and pretty much a reliable internet connection. Again, I know technical things happen, but try and do that and we'll have our second exam. Again, all homework, all quizzes are reopened so you can go back to them and you can basically Get better grades if you want to, all the way up to our end date of May 22nd. After our second exam, I will put up a grading calculator, which is going to be on Excel, where you can estimate where you need to be or whatever grade you'll like out of this class. Okay? So, again, we're only doing up to chapter 9, so no managerial chapters. So after this exam, it's only two chapters that we're going to do. Each chapter has a week, and then finish off with exam 3. And that gives you a whole week to basically catch up if you miss any of the homework, or you want better grades for the homework, or... Uh, Quizzes, also to do your corrections for exam three. And remember, corrections for exam two, or exam one, sorry. Exam one are due by next week, by Friday at midnight when your exam two is due. Okay? So if you haven't done those corrections, please do those corrections, and then we'll do the same as before. And I can't give you all access to the exam again. I will give you what you got wrong in email form. Okay? That's basically it. So, yeah, everything's on the All assignments, all homeworks, just like we, we've been doing. So, That'll be it. Again, sorry about the whole uh, cutoff in this lecture, but both sections of this lecture will be uh, uploaded um, to YouTube, be the first talk, and then I'll post them on D2L, again, probably later this evening. Okay. So again, I basically have to convert these videos, I found out, to where it can actually be uploaded for E2L purposes. Uh, it's a little bit of a pain, but it works. On Jargon the information, go back. Alright, all the dates are on um, Wiley, for one, plus I'm going to send you reminders, and again, all end dates for all assignments 
or May 22nd, last day of class. So, just remember May 22nd end date. And then for the test, since the tests are not all right yet, they will appear. And again, I want to constantly remind y'all that the test is open, the test is going in today, so y'all be fine. Yeah, the semester has extended till the 22nd of May, not April, of May. So, again, Wiley is going to have the due dates. My calendar is all screwed up, but uh, I'll see if they can show up uh, on the calendar on D2L. If I can put them on there, I'll try to mess with them probably sometime this weekend, see if I can. Again, everything is separate exams, everything else is due on the 22nd, so exams and quizzes, okay? Well, besides that, that's it for today. So, if y'all do not have any questions, y'all guys are free to go. And I will see you on Tuesday. So, again, we're going to go back over the concept checks. And then we're going to go over Chapter 7 to get y'all ready for this exam that's going to come up next week.